Exactly. Yeah. Uh, this is the OGM weekly call on Thursday, June 22nd, 2023. Um, and I think we're going to continue our conversation from last week about Indigenous ways of knowing. I'll just wait a little bit for more people to, to come in. And uh, I was just checking in with Doug, who is in Montenegro, and uh, a friend of his who is a ship's doctor on a cruise ship is coming in to dock tomorrow and will be visiting. And I was marveling at how those ships stay upright. Because <clears throat> they're, as, as Doug just described it, they're basically apartment buildings on, on, on a hull. Like, I, I did a tiny bit of work for um, Carnival Cruises a long time ago through the Institute for the Future. And it was very interesting. We met a bunch of people. And these people have hotel, restaurant, and performance venues and amusement parks all on board, like a little floating platform where you've got to do everything. And you're not allowed, you know, you have to be really careful with the ships because um, basically harbor practices have changed dramatically in order to keep cities clean. Uh, so it's a, it's a crazy thing. And then then comes the pandemic. So it's a mad world. Greetings all. Anybody with uh, anybody with a want to do a very light check in? Like, what's up for you? We're good. Um, well, I'll I'll do a brief check in. Please. I've been thinking a lot about why in this problem oriented society with technical capacity, we don't look at climate change um, as a technical problem. I mean, with, with parts. Uh, people don't look for the parts, uh, the cross connections. It's just amazing to me. Uh, I think some people are looking at it as a technical problem, maybe not enough that there's a critical mass or maybe the policymakers don't seem to be acting that way. Because I know I know that I watch a few people who are very, very much trying to pick it apart analytically or scientifically, no? Yeah, there are, there are some, but it, you'd hope it would be more a general capacity from a high school education to think in terms of problem solving. Right, right. I, I think that gets filtered through our capitalism and financial system. So there are obviously people who care deeply about it, but they don't get a lot of traction because it's it doesn't make financial sense. Yeah, or I mean it 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 totally could make financial sense, but the you know the the general wisdom of the capitalist community is that it's not an interesting problem. Um, there's a bunch we could talk about on, on that topic. Um, let me bring us back to uh, picking up from last week's program, which was already in progress last week. Uh, and I was wondering if somebody would like to, uh, if maybe a couple of us could summarize where we've been in this conversation and then separately i was interested in what what should we be aiming for in this conversation what would be some some fruitful ways of framing uh this 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 talk about what does indigenous ways of knowing mean and i'm hoping that mark Carranza, um makes it into the into the conversation relatively soon um but anybody want to take a swing at like where we were Nobody wants to come to that. Bueller? Bueller? <laughs> um, and I, I know it's kind of hard, but just um, to refresh, uh, like refresh the, um, let me put a uh, link to last week's call in the chat so you can all see the kinds of things we were mentioning. Um, well, what I recall uh, very schematically is a kind of uh, slightly romantic view of what indigenous people are like. And then we began a slightly more critical phase of looking at the concept of the people and the way they actually live. Um, that sounds good. I think a lot of this is about how we how we frame and what, what lessons we learn from the different cultures. Um, 
And part of the problem here is that different cultures are good and bad or uh, brutal and gentle at different times in their lifespans. And we tend to collapse these things down uh, with one particular memory or, or something else like that. Um, I'm interested in one of the broad sweeps here that I'm interested in particularly is how we manage to um, how basically what I'll call sort of left brain male thinking managed to eat our brains and the planet uh, and wipe out a whole bunch of more balanced ways of seeing the world uh, that were really useful. And uh, we have been struggling with that ever since uh, in lots of different ways. And I, so, so for me, one of the reasons that earlier ways of knowing uh, matter a lot is that they seem to me in many cases and not all cases to be more balanced about their, their attitudes about people, about nature, about the planet, about all those kinds of things. And if we could re-adopt some of those ways of seeing that might actually help us solve some of the problems we've got now. Pete, go ahead. Uh, thanks, Jerry. That I I think that's I like that. Um, I wanted to make an observation. You've 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 most of you have heard me talk about hyperscale social structures before. So, um, <clears throat> I uh, so it wasn't that people decided to be. It, it wasn't that people, in good conscience, decided that capitalism was the best structure. Um, uh, the best structure that outcompeted other hyperscale social structures, largely outcompeted. Obviously, there's there's still a bunch of them around, <clears throat> but the the one that outcompeted the others uh, in the arena of survival and growth uh, was the one that was, you know, disruptive, acquisitive, uh, imperialistic, you know, um, destructive to other systems. So it's it's a little bit like it's uh, and then another thing I I'd say about hyperscale social structures is it's really hard for one individual to think about how big and how complex those things are, but kind of a way to think about it it's kind of like there's <clears throat> um, there's a mind virus that took over and you know we're fighting we're we we have to figure out how to fight that mind virus. Um, the, the epidemic of that mind virus and not just change hearts and minds, but actually have strategies that disable or disrupt that hyperscale social structure that has evolved to be super efficient and super lethal and um, super consumptive. You're sort of saying that human history is an episode of The Last of Us? Um... I'm just kidding. <laughs> The Last of Us is is a interesting way to tell the tale of of humans surviving or not surviving. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And I can post in the in the chat that the mind virus is something uh, possibly called Wetico, uh, which is a Native American concept that sort of means psychic tar starvation or insatiable hunger, and is kind of a characteristic of. Uh, this modern, civilized way of being on the planet. Uh, Doug, please. I mean, sorry, Doug B. <laughs> um, I, there's a, just to sort of shift the, the contextualization in, an, in a way that might be interesting to, to explore, um, which is that our, our trajectory in terms of Western civilization um, has been exhibiting a form of psychosis in the way we experience each other, the world, uh, and our disconnection and, and loss of, of relationship to our world. And I think that's at the essence and core of um, indigenous experience, their experience today. And I'm talking today. So just to sort of like isolate the focus from 
all of the sacrifices and monstrous indigenous previous civilizational anomalies and, and dystopias. Like I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the, the, the orientation and way of relating to and experiencing themselves, themselves in relation to their environment, themselves in relation to the rest of the biome, themselves in relation to the world, the universe, and beyond. And um, our, our bias in shifting into cognition as the center of our experience and orientation and validity um, at the expense of our, our physical body connection on an earth level to, uh, to the magnetic field we live within, our disconnection on a water and emotional level to balance where everything is geared toward driving fear or anger um, as a steady state, um, loss of safety from an earth standpoint. These are all like elemental energetic dimensions of our existence. Air is where the intellect resides and that's where 85, 90% of everybody is preoccupied in our world today. Fire, which is the transformation, the bringing things into manifestation, transform transforming something, transforming wood into light and heat. It's the energetic doing action part of things is running rampant, but without the balancing effects of earth and water. And um, space, which is the container for all of them, it's also the connection to source, it's the undifferentiated awareness of being part, being part of a whole and transcendence of ego and the I and the self is like gone. So egocentricity rules <laughs> and uh, Instagram, the, the, the sort of apex manifestation um, and Andy Warhol's everybody's famous for 50. Well, now everybody's famous in their own minds all the time. And, <laughs> and um, so the whole thing is out of balance as, but it's a, it's a product and function of our loss of connection to self on a fully embodied whole being basis. Hence the idea of psychosis. And um, a, a friend that I worked with, Bernie Krauss, is one of the fathers of, of, bio, uh, of acoustic ecology. He ran around the world starting in 1968 recording in natural, the most remote natural biomes around the world. I called him the keeper of the voice of the planet, of the living planet. And from 68 to the present, over 50% of those areas are now silent, also known as, you know, devoid of life. <laughs> so, um, and he coined a phrase, um, which was uh, nature deficit disorder. And, and uh, we as, as living beings, going out into nature, being in contact with nature, having our feet in the earth without the intermediation of socks and shoes, which insulate us and cut us off from grounding in the magnetic field of the planet we live in, the environment we live in. Like all, everything that we've done has been designed to disconnect us from our world, our reality and each other. And, um, so just a living take on, on a way of orienting and relating. And what the indigenous people didn't do is forget. And, and you know, around the world, all of them have one thing in common, which is they remain connected to a part of sensory awareness of uh, the reality and world they're in and they're, and they're uh, uh, connected to. So with that, I'm complete.
Yeah. Thanks, Doug. Um, Stuart, and take whatever time you want to step in. So I, I, I agree with everything that Doug has said. Uh, and um, thank you for the question. So here's what pops up in, in my mind. Um, <clears throat> the, the notion of um, picking up on Doug's theme of psychosis or um, schizophrenia um, that we live in. I started to think about um, history. And I started to think about um, how did we get into that psychosis? And the, the, the simple explanation that popped up in my mind is um, fear of predators. You know, we, we were these little naked human beings running around the planet, and there were dinosaurs and tigers and lions. And if you weren't careful, you'd be lunch. And so this whole fear-based mentality um, is, is very much, you know, deep in our, in our psychology, the whole notion of, you know, we resort to lizard brain when we're in uh, 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 times of, of, of stress or threat. Um, and it carries over into, um, even though there's no threat of fear or death, you know, when we think, when people think they're gonna lose their job, that same psychology um, pops in. So in some sense, beyond that, it became a, <clears throat> a mantra, a vision, a quest to get beyond that fear and conquer slash subjugate slash um, tame the evil forces of earth. And, and so in some sense, and it's funny because I heard this last night watching the wonderful TV drama Bosch, which I just got into. It's a wonderful um, escape, you know, and he was talking about <clears throat> learning in the orphanage where he was. We all have two dogs inside of us. Which one do you want to feed, the good dog or the, or the, <clears throat> the evil dog? And... Um, then technology starts to appear in the form of weaponization and, um, and the ability to subjugate other populations. And so somehow that has grown. Um, and also out of that came, let's exploit the technology. You know, let's see if we can use this to our advantage. And somehow, quote, you know, the notion of, of capitalism evolved out of that. I'm just, you know, I'm speculating, but, you know, here I am creating. Um, periodically, historically, you know, uh, um, a new religion has cropped up, which all have the same ideal. You know, it's about reconnection to earth. It's about indigenous wisdom. Um, and along with that, you know, prophets and messiahs. So in some ways, there is this deep longing um, inside of us for um, a world that works without the destruction, without the violence, um, in a in a in a in a place of um, of peace. Um, and so here we are, in some ways, you know at a cusp of evolution, um, <laughs> you know, where will it go? What will it be as these um, warring fractions, factions play themselves out? Um, and, and that's where we're sitting and speculating and wondering um, um, today. I have spoken. Love that. Thank you. Um, Carl, and then I'll step in after.
Yeah, Stuart uh, touched on a couple of things I've been thinking about. I mean, it really, I think it really, I mean, it goes back to uh, the, uh, to the creation story and, and the whole tradition of, of dominion. I mean, just think if the word that's been translated as dominion actually meant stewardship. And then the other, th the other thing too is about um, the, um, there's a great article I had seen that talked about um, imagining the like utopian um, university of the future and stuff, and then trying to live that into existence. Um, and part of it said, one of the things in there that I drew from it is that uh, uh, basically privilege means you have the freedom to fail and stuff, which struck me. And then, um, and then also, I guess there's a, there's like the tripping over a root and the saber tooth tiger got you. There's the the that preservation piece of it, and um, and things. So, and then the I guess the last part is about um, wanting predict um, want predictability. I think is another huge part of it. So. I'll stop from there. Thanks, Carl. Um, I want to unpack a little bit what Pete said about hyperscale systems and whether and how we have any control or say over them. And um, uh, that's interesting. The system wants to lower my hand for me. There we go. Uh, and I wanted to share in, for example, um, and well, now there's too many things over. Here we go. In 1493, Pope Alexander VI, Rodrigo Borgia, basically uh, writes Inter Cetera, which uh, is part, leads to the Treaty of Tordesillas, which basically gives uh, Spain, divides the world between Spain and, um, uh, and Portugal for explorations, and basically says that anyone who doesn't know uh, the name of Jesus Christ is your vassal. Uh, in the treaty. And so I think there are moments like this in history that empower, enable, turn, tweak, motivate, whatever you want to say, uh, a whole bunch of activity that then spills out afterward that uh, changes the, the, the path of history, that changes the course of history a lot. And I can point to a few of those moments like that uh, whether it's sort of manifest destiny in the U.S. or other sorts of things, and then in, in, and then in other realms, other statements that kind of gave permission or motivation to large groups of people and shifted how energies were used on the planet, um, uh, mostly not for the good of, of lots of other people, um, and. And, uh, you know, could you go back and kill baby Hitler kind of thing, like if, if there was time travel, but do we have some degree of influence over those moments and those responses and those actions? Um, and, I, and I don't know, Pete, if that's like um, how that fits what you were saying, and I've, I've not read up enough on, on sort of hyperscale or superscale or, uh, and super organisms and how they evolve, but it seems like there are, there are sometimes these turning points that matter a lot. Yeah, it's uh, maybe maybe a little deeper than I've well maybe a little deeper than I've thought about. It. I think the the overarching thing for me is that we humans tend to look for an individual like Hitler or a turning point like the fall of the Berlin, Berlin Wall or something like that. The we we focus on the. The, the random event as if it were the only thing that could have happened rather than looking at kind of an, an overarching story over <clears throat> thousands of years where the 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 you know uh western people like to call it the march of progress whatever you would call that um you know the march of doom or something like that um 
over the thousands of years, there's a, a tendency to kind of move towards a certain place. And it doesn't matter too much, you know, what if um, the, the things that we think of as turning points, you know, did a, a small shift, a, a tactical shift in that overall direction, but the overall direction is a lot bigger and a lot, um, a lot more, uh, has a lot more momentum than, than we attribute to one individual. So, you know, so it is in my little human brain, you know, I think of Rupert Murdoch or Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk, God forbid, you know, and it's like, oh my God, these are the, you know, it would have been somebody else uh, if you had gone back in time and killed, you know, any of their grandparents and they weren't born. <laughs> largely the same things would have unfolded um, maybe in a little bit different way, but the, the large thing is got a lot more mass than uh, a few individuals. Um, and which brings up a bunch of really interesting things, <clears throat> including uh, the great man theory of history, which is like, it's, it's all about these individuals. Um, one of the things you said was, it's as, as if it were the only thing that could have happened, which doesn't quite fit what I was kind of intending in the sense of um, for m in many cases, when we look back on moments in history, we're like, oh my God, that person was so significant. But as the as this event was happening, it could have gone either direction at any moment. There were little razor's edge incidents all along. Uh, a bullet that had gone an inch you know, to the left would have killed that person and history might have been changed. And I think what you're saying is, these energies, whatever the big outcome was of the moments in history we're talking about, we're just going to happen, and it was uh, who knows who the, whose name we were going to remember afterward, uh, and blame for, or uh, or um, crown for the, the moment. It was just going to happen because that that thing was was in the air. It was uh, it was in the flow. It was it was heading toward us anyway. Is that kind of where that's, you're going? That's pretty close. Yeah, I, and I think it's even more than that. So, uh, you know whatever precipitated World War I or World War II or something like that, it actually, that's, that's a big shift. And the outcome of, you know, you, you, could, you could maybe say that World War I, very, very, very simplistically, World War I led to World War II. World War II led to um, Pax Americana, um, the global domination of the world by the United States. So that's actually a pretty big shift. And you know, that wasn't foreordained, I think, by, you know, whatever came before it. But there's kind of an even, even larger thing. Um, as soon as, as soon as you had social animals, uh, like humans, uh, that were competing over resources, and had the ability to self modify the way that their cultures worked. Um, uh, it sprang into being that we had hyperscale social structures and, and kind of a, kind of like a domino effect. It's, it's very, very, very likely that 2,000, 5,000 years later, you've got uh, some really big hyperscale social structures that are just, that are just like killing machines. They're, they're super efficient at doing what they do. So capitalism is just, um, it's the, the winner of a bunch of, uh, a bunch of uh, evolutionary battles between different uh, other hyperscale social structures. And you, know, you can just say that, well, maybe it wouldn't be exactly capitalism. Maybe it wouldn't be the United States. But it's kind of foreordained, I, th I think, that you're going to have a hyper-efficient um, thing that's, that's built around competition and domination. Um, and, you know, that's, it's just going to be the winner, basically. Uh, something like that. So it doesn't have to be the United States. It doesn't have to exactly be capitalism. But you're going to have a domination machine built out of, uh, you know, thousands of years of, of social structures interacting with each other. And interestingly, Janet asked in the chat whether evolution favors the aggressor. Um, and one of my sad observations about human history is that all too often, uh, pacifist, uh, matriarchal, other, other kinds of cultures are overtaken by warring cultures because they don't have the weapons or the skills to defend themselves well. 
Uh, and so the I think history time favors aggressors all too often. And I would love to find some means of living on the planet where that doesn't turn out to be the, the dynamic or the case. And one of the interesting things about Cory Doctorow's book, Walk Away, is that when aggressors show up and take over the village that has been created by the, this interesting group of people, uh, they just walk away from that village, turn it over to the aggressors and like, good luck to you, they, you, you will destroy this thing. But <clears throat> because in that science fiction future, there is the capacity to 3D print and sort of construct everything you want and make the next village better, um, you're okay walking away because you can go start the thing again someplace. And that seems like a, it's one little spin on how to handle this dynamic. And I'm not sure it's even a satisfying spin. Um, uh, I'd rather have some sort of cordyceps fungus that infects people with goodwill. Uh, wouldn't that be kind of cool? Can we do that? Can we engineer cordyceps so that it creates goodwill instead of this other thing? Uh, Stuart, then Doug C. Yeah. Um, so just to pick up on 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 exactly what what Pete and Jerry were saying, um, there's this phenomenon of emergence that seems to be going on, and what is emerging is stuff that people on this call don't like very much. <laughs> but that's that's the trend line. That's that's where it's that's where it's it 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 seems to be headed, and. Um, and here we are, in in some sense, um, in a place of protest, in a place of no, there there's a better way, uh, in a place of looking for you know other solutions, in a place of recognition that this is um, terribly destructive, and in some sense, um, you know, going back to the schizophrenia piece, this is this is. Um, um indicia of the worst of humanity that this was not quote um god's plan however you hold the word god um, um and and so um what can we do you know what Russian. what 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 can we do that's the question i mean and i think that's the bottom line question we have wrestled with and wrestled with and wrestled with here and and periodically it pops up you know jerry you just said it how can we infect a virus in the whole population um knowing that there will always be a marginal element um that is going to be outside whatever order um is created um um you know right now um you know it doesn't look like um there's any kind of a win-win out there to, you know, to quote a phrase, um, but who knows, you know, who knows, you know, um, so we keep tilting at windmills. Um, why? Because um, there's nothing else to do, but but follow the, you know, the deepest part of our own um, hearts and psyches um, to preserve the spirit of humanity. Um, to preserve that spirit of humanity. At least that's the cosmology that um, that I've been living in. Thanks, Stuart. Uh, Doug, see whenever you'd like. Well, my thought is pretty simple. Um, I think the conversation tends to divide between talking about individuals and talking about large collectives states, nations, or whatever. Uh, it seems to me like the real space for innovation and engagement and understanding is the meso level, the in-between. Uh, and we just don't go there very much. So we polarize ourselves into just me or all of us together. And then it comes out kind of hopeless. Um, on the hopeless side, I, I think most of you have read uh, Joseph Tainter's The Collapse of Complex Societies, where basically he's saying, look, we keep making things more complex. And the more complex they are, the more fragile they are. And the more complex they are, the more elites own the fragility uh, and don't want to do anything about it. Uh, 
I think where I'm going is that how do we get some basic competence in what we're talking about uh, that goes beyond uh, platitudes? Finished. Can you say a little bit more about the meso level? Well, it's it's the uh, what's the name of the window with 120 people in it? I'm forgetting it at the moment, but uh, that anthropologist came up with. You don't mean the Overton window. You mean yeah, the Overton Dunbar. Right, Dunbar, Dunbar? Dunbar. Yeah, but Dunbar, Overton, right. Overton doesn't have a number so, of people associated with it. So, so that's saying something about the mezzo level. The mezzo level is where we actually interact most days with most people, is with intermediate institutions that are more than one psyche, but not all of them. Uh, and it seems to me it's the place where things could happen, but we don't look at it. So we disempower ourselves. I like that thought a lot, Doug. I want to come back to it. Um, uh, there have been very interesting conversations on multiple lists about the Dunbar number or many Dunbar numbers or many different breaks in social dynamics and how they work. And we're all kind of kicking around ideas about that, but I think it's a, it's a useful place to, to think a, a lot more. Um, Pete, then Doug B. Um, I, I kind of wanted to agree. I, I like uh, Doug's um, observation of polarization between individual and large scale, like civilization scale. And it's clear to me um, that the answer for lots of things is um, smaller, organiz smaller autonomous organizations uh, in what we call decentralization and federation now. Um, so I, I know I, I work and think in that kind of area, and I know a few other groups of folks working and thinking in that area, as, as is o, OGM. Um, I, and I don't know much, I, I don't feel like I can say much more than that, but you know, I'm putting, a, putting my money on that bet, kind of whatever that is. Um, a small comment on decentralization and federation, as you said it, Pete, I was thinking it's very interesting that you meant those two words, I think, as very similar concepts, as related concepts. And one of them is all about the going apart, and the other one is all about the coming together. And they're both about the interactions of a bunch of groups, right? But yeah. but but one of them is about the the dispersal, and the other one is about how do we agree? And yep. it makes me think that I like the word federation more than decentralization uh, because I'm interested in how do we agree and come together, but I don't ever really like the word federation when I see it. I think of space federations, I think of uh, federalist society, I think uh, like the Fed role like, gives me a little heebie-jeebie just unconsciously that I'm just bubbling to the surface now, but I like the intention of federation more than the rest. So maybe it's it's group association, maybe it's something, I, don't, I have no idea what the better semantics are. The, the languaging is difficult. Um, yeah. Uh, and, and has, you know, has already been colonized uh, hundreds of years ago. So um, similarly, for a, a long time, a number of us were talking about sovereigns as the uh, base unit of, you know, decentralization or federation or whatever. And it turns out that sovereign is actually even worse than saying federation. Um, it's a really bad word for a lot of people. So that yeah. language is difficult. Yeah. Jerry, you use the word bubbling. Um, I've been using the term um, islands of sanity um, that are kind of bubbling to the surface. And, um, you know, will there be critical mass at some point in time? Maybe. Mm -hmm. You know, before or after, you know, total destruction, maybe. <laughs> It's a race. <laughs> it does. It does. It does create a certain dramatic tension in our societal moment that is uh, intriguing. Um, Doug B, whenever you'd like. To, to go to go orthogonal a little bit, but on the same meme, on the same point. Um, the pol polarities lens always ends up in service to disconnection. And, and I think maybe there, 
a, a different way in response, Doug, to your, your comment, which I think is dead on, a different way of, of looking at it instead of uh, um, the middle ground or getting above, um, that there, maybe there's, there's a proto level that um, affords a, an appreciation understanding of uh, the, the forces and energies and dynamics at play. And then that is subject to fractal reality. So um, you can zoom all the way into a cell or into uh, somebody's, the operation of somebody's body as a living thing. And you can zoom out to uh, a society, a, a, a continent, a world. And um, what is and, and what manifests and the way in which um, humans as a species respond or react and relate to that um, is within a context where there are sort of some fundamental natural laws. That if you do this, then that. <laughs> there are, things have consequences. And we create our reality in terms of the relative resonance and, and, uh, and, and comedy between us as a species and the biome and the world around us and each other or not. And um, the tendency to leave, the tendency instead of going toward natural laws and properties of, rea of the reality we're in tends to get supplanted with our capacity to abstract and to get intellectual and to elaborate and to layer and make deeper and deeper and deeper abstractions and layers built on top of abstractions and layers and to get away from the immediacy of what are the real sort of multidimensional mechanics of reality and natural law. Um, and those natural laws apply on the part, on the sub, you know, on the microscopic level and they apply on the macro level. Um, in that sense, there are some that are actually consistent um, and underpin everything. So just uh, another take, I'm complete. You make me wonder, Doug, if we would agree on what the fundamental natural laws are, because I think the way you express it's like, of course, we would all agree on these fundamental natural laws and that drives a lot of behavior. And I, I'm, I'm, I think that we would have a really interesting debate on what some of those are. And we might learn a lot about how we think from articulating what we think the fundamental laws are. Um, and some of them might be fundamental behaviors. Some of them might be fundamental assumptions. I don't know exactly how to phrase it, but, but I'm, I'm curious what those laws would be and, whether, and what, to what degree we all even just those of us sitting here in this conversation would agree would agree on them. Yeah, uh, what also pops up in my mind from what Doug said was, you know, uh, reality. <laughs> what an interesting word that is, and you know, we're you know, there's so many different places that we could that we could take that word. Um, so here we are, you know, existing in a in some ways in an over intellectualized conversation. <clears throat> about stuff that at some fundamental level is is much more simplistic uh, or might be. Hi. Uh, Doug C., floor is yours. So I don't know if the fundamental laws would work in our favor. If, for example, I think it's fundamental about humans that they're sexual, hypersexual, which means more of us. And we make connections, which means we're weaving an ever tighter fabric of society till we strangle ourselves because we can't move. Uh, those are two fundamental laws about human behavior. And uh, the outcome is not terrific. It means collapse. Um, not only do we want to live to think about the, the middle space 
uh, in terms of space, that is meta and micro uh, systems, micro and yeah, yeah. Um, but also in time, because maybe the sweet place in time is early in the civilizational cycle. Late in the civilizational cycle is not so terrific in words we're finding out. So like there's apt optimum sized groups, there's optimum sized spaces and there's optimized time frames. Finish. Um, thanks, Doug. I found myself reacting negatively to your second fundamental truth that groups weave, weave themselves ever closer together until they sort of choke themselves. Uh, or something like that. I'm paraphrasing badly, but can you say more about what you meant? Well, I liked your paraphrase. It sounded pretty good to me. Uh, just, just that, yeah. I, mean, I, I imagine if you had 100 people standing in the middle of a football field uh, and they're close together, any one of them can move, although there's a little resistance through the group. But if each one reaches out and grabs the arm of somebody nearby, the structure becomes impervious to movement. And I think that that's what we do. We have a society that's hyperly complex connected and it's very hard to change. So our connections and our relationships bind us in ways that resist change. Is that a piece of what you're saying? Uh, definitely. So the relationship part is great when you have smaller numbers of people, uh, but they become pathological later in the process and maybe later in the process is inevitable. But also the these little bindings, the, the fabric of society is a, one way of talking about it, are also the vectors for change. <clears throat> these are the pathways that change follows to cause sometimes deep transformations in society, right? Uh, I, well, first of all, you said little groups, uh, and I'm talking really about slightly larger groups. Uh, where the creativity is more uh, creating constraints than opportunities. And just if ever, you know, if it, I, I talk to a lot of people. So for example, in the last week, I've talked to some people who have new grants. What that does to their time frame is take them away from climate change because they want to finish their grant first. Let me finish my grant, then I'll worry about climate change. But that grant, then links those people to other people. And since everybody's doing that, I mean, we spend most of our days making relationships, tighter and tighter and tighter strangulation. Anyone else have thoughts about that particular idea? Or does it either trouble you or do you agree with it? I, I, I think I th I'd love to unpack it a little bit. <laughs> Um, so, um, connection, um, connection in terms of, you know, proximity and within a context that's a structure or a frame is different than a human, emotional, sensorial, embodied connection to another living being. So, you know, there are two different connection dynamics at play in that. Um, and, and earlier, Doug, when you referenced sort of hypersexuality, so, um, you know, one of the four fountains, one of the fundamental human needs or drivers is reproduction. Um, but that actually is something that uh, changes over the arc of, 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 uh, of a lifetime. So at, at younger ages, it's, it's about sex, but at older ages, it's about what am I leaving behind? What's my, what's my uh, legacy? Um, and so in that, in the times we're living in, um, I think hypersexuality is, is, an, is an expression of imbalance of that sort of one of the pieces of that psychosis I referred to earlier. It's not a balanced reflection and representation. In fact, you don't see indigenous tribes literally populating themselves out of existence. Why isn't that happening if that's such a natural thing? It's a distortion effect in, in what 
reality and our paradigm, you know, the prevailing paradigm is today. It's a byproduct and effect of that. Um, so, you know, there, um, I really think that it's not connection intrinsically that creates um, the strangulation you're referring to creates the fixation, the hardening up of the frame, the society, the culture, the patterns, and the ways uh, people are, are uh, doing what they're doing societally. Um, I think that, that fixation, that hardening up, that turning the world into nouns, into objects, and attempting to um, impose and project into reality that somehow we actually have the ability to control it and to, and to, and to control the, the um, outputs and outcomes is, is at the root of the problem because the truth of the matter is life happens and shit happens and we're not in control of nothing. Um, but there's a whole bunch of science and, and, you know, construction around projection. And, you know, the church back in the day, you know, said nature was wild and it needed to be tamed. Tamed by who? Tamed by us. Like the whole concept of control and, and, uh, um, and predictability and, uh, and affect over future. Um, is, is fundamentally misguided. And that hardening up is really where that strangling ourselves to death uh, under, our, uh, under our own systems, mm -hmm. under our own constructs, yeah. I think is more the dynamic of complete. Thanks, Doug. B. Doug C., is your hand up from earlier or are you um, stepping uh, back? No, I'm done. Sorry. No worries. Um, Mark, the floor is yours when you'd like. Good to see you. Um, I apologize. Um, I had a number of things in my head and um, they spaced out the actual time for this call <laughs> preparing 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 um so um apparently my brain is is not particularly um ready for the real world yet um i heard something amazing from doug uh and from um from doug c doug carmichael and from doug breitbart um certainly you know, we hold, we let go, we hold, we let go, we hold, we let go. That's life. It's not only hold. That is never the case. Um, it is a dynamic and not a static um, system. And this notion that we're not in control of nothing. Yes, we are. That's the question that you know, Mary Catherine Bateson talks about in our own metaphor that Gil Friend um, loves, a wonderful book about the effects of conscious process on human or biological evolution. Where does decision making come in when we talk about evolution? Now, there's two important notions I could just mic drop um one would be the book by owen barfield um called um saving the appearances which is basically his way of saying let's look at pre um how does he put it at the the pre-human past and the human past how how the consciousness of pre-literate people dealt with what was real and how we have now models which we think of as real abstractions in doug's case but really uh-uh we're just looking at the appearances and calling that science now it's a very short incredibly difficult book i don't expect 
out of a hundred people holding hands, three people to ever read that book. But it's that, and and that's the depth of my questioning. How do I inspire people to read that this type of thing? Um, the other thing is a, uh, um, you know, I'm I'm lucky to have a uh, a garden and I can have a fire at night and invite people over to talk and whiskey. And my friend Josh is back from Tartu University where he's getting his PhD in semiotics and kind of being paid by um, Estonia um, to basically study for his PhD and write papers. And so he's arguing that, you know, there's a cybernetic mode which we have to transcend to get out of if then else linear um or even you know second order cybernetics adaptiveness to get to the next level of human consciousness now these are big again mic drop boom you know i don't expect anybody to go to either of these two points and say oh yeah i understand this because last night of course i'm kind of going well wait a second, Josh, when you say this, you know, what are the implications? You know, how do we make this change? You know, and and, and so it's not going to be um, me marching in on a horse saying, I have all the answers. Rather, there's an amazing amount of questions out there. Now, I am so sorry that I haven't been <laughs> brainy enough or or capable enough to basically you know report on a i m e which i will have to you know bow out and report again but basically these people from australia got this funding for a 30 year project to basically use indigenous wisdom to transform society from the bottom <laughs> up and they came to san francisco and they spent three days basically doing performances with puppets as well as um, Maori dance. And they met about 20 or 30 people. And they spent all this money and all this time and all this preparation to meet this tiny little group of people. And now they're going to L.A. and Paris and Geneva and London and spending all these um, global warming resources to spread their message, and they're doing amazing things. It's the, the you know the notion of a program death of an organization I thought was incredible. The notion that the CEO doesn't want to be the CEO that's incredible. The the notion that they want to get a million underserved youth to match with in four person cells with somebody who can be a mentor from uh, a joy corporation, joy organization, you know, somebody who in, you know, Orange Telecom or AT&T is willing to basically sit in with two underserved children and kind of a more indigenous, indigenous mentor. And as a cell of four have hundreds of thousands of these cells of four to basically have, you know, a transformation of an extra familial, familial, extra cultural cell that does what we're doing here. We're meeting as little cells to talk about important stuff. And then that each of the members of that cell can then say, hey, that was a really good experience. When this little cell ends its natural lifetime, I'm going to start my own cell or several cells with different little people, i.e., you know, again, the multiple cells that each of us um, are in. Uh, Doug Carmichael talks about the way he has all these other groups he interacts with. Well, we bring from this group or from the other groups that we're in and it cross pollinates. And it's that kind of, I would not call that indigenous wisdom but it's that kind of rules for radical cells that makes really robust change if that's the baseline 
of what everybody in our community, everybody in our city, everybody in our nation does to have these formal, informal ties. We come up, we come together, we break apart. We come together, we get something valuable, we share it with these other communities. It's not always that we're going to have these locked arms that prevent movement. No, no, no. We make a connection that's strong, and then we can re replicate that strong connection and that strong letting go of the connection because we trust the people that we've made the connection with will replicate that elsewhere. Thank you for listening. Boy, was that a complex um, uh, brain dump. And I apologize. Um, I'm going to try to find A-I-M-E. I put a couple Wonderful links in the, in the chat. Am I, am I finding the right A-I-M-E there? They're doing these things called Indigenous Knowledge Labs. And I haven't seen the YouTube that they have about that. But basically, they've been doing things for 20 years in Australia. Indigenous Knowledge Labs for 20 years in Australia. And they've got all kinds of awards. And again, this is new information to me since last Thursday. And certainly, you know, I am a skeptic, but I'm also open to finding new information. And of course, the human connection that they had, you know, everything felt great for these people from New Zealand. You know, Stephanie, a, um, a person that I talked to about how um, colonialism has not allowed me to access my ancestral past. And she says, same here. Yes, yeah, same here. I don't know, you know, the storylines that my, you know, culture talks about that link, you know, for years and decades and centuries, all the way back to the ancestors. She doesn't have access to that. She has access to the idea but not the actual experience of having that connection to the ancestors. Um, and it's great that they got this funding and all this money and were able to do that, but, um, huh, wow. What, what are all the other implications of, you know, um, did, they, uh, did they get their message across? Obviously they did because I'm relating it to people who've never heard of them and can, you know, now you know branch out and reconnect with them and help them um in a way that might be what doug um breitbart was pointing to when i questioned his direction thank you sorry to take so long mm, thanks mark good food for thought uh stewart yeah, so some some random thoughts. <laughs> First is a humorous one. When Doug mentioned earlier we're oversexualized, my immediate reaction was, <laughs> "You're talking about yourself, Doug." <laughs> I'm sorry. I just found that found that kind of funny. Um, the other thoughts um, we're talking in 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 absolutes. Okay. I missed the joke, by the way. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm not going to repeat it because, you know, it's one of those things that kind of just fell flat. That was my my sense of it. Maybe it needed to be said in the moment. Anyway, um, we're talking about phenomena that are, you know, at two ends of the spectrum. And, you know, and... I think there's much more, so much more complexity. It's not either or, you know, and 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 the idea of looking for the either or is just, you know, um, doesn't doesn't serve us well. One, um, two, um, we do want control, and we don't have it, and we do have it. I mean, and that's an example of what I was just what I, what I was just. Um, talking about. Um, I remember getting into um, advanced economics as my undergraduate major. And in the advanced economic textbooks, 
there were these 27 page formulas explaining economic activity. And I just went, this is just bullshit. This is just a bunch of crap. This is this is the greatest example of, you know, the inability of human beings to deal with uncertainty uh, and 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 not knowing. Um, and and uh, because the formulas were just, you know, absurd. Um, and I think that that's all I really wanted to um, point to in this in this in this discussion. Oh, and the other the only other piece was that um, you know there were those metaphysicians who would say that on on this plane of existence that everything is perfect the way it is because uh, we get to experience all of these emotions um, that we're talking about, um, which you don't experience in 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 other worlds. Um, it's just something to 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 um, to think about, and and also the last piece is um, let's um, let's stay back from the notion of taking ourselves too seriously in these conversations. Um, oh, but that's so fun. <laughs> <laughs> and unfortunately, I, I've got to leave in a couple of minutes, but um, I thank everybody for this uh, level of engagement. Thanks, Stuart, and thanks for being here. Um, how about we go into a little bit of silence? I think I, I know that my neurons are crowded right now and uh, let's I'll, I'll bring us back out or after a while, if anybody else wants to pick up the conversation, feel free to as well. But let's go into a, a bit of silence here. I think a piece of what we're talking about here is the thing I typed into the chat a little while ago, which are, which is what are the dynamics of broad social change? I think. Uh, and that's intersecting or connected in interesting ways to how we see, how we think, uh, whether we're connected to our senses, whether we're connected to nature, whether we're way abstract and up in the clouds, all those kinds of things, all those things are important factors in how change happens. But I think one of our common interests is this notion of um, catalyzing large-scale change. And I use the word catalyzing very gingerly because it's possible that there is no such thing because shit just happens and it happens in waves and motions and we're just like particles participating in the change and here we are floating along. Um, so Doug C, off to you. Okay, Jerry, I've been thinking about the question just the way you put it, how do you get large scale social change? And I've been reading lately Arnold Toynbee and the study of history. And he takes as the, uh, the key players, civilizations of which he discusses 28 and why some fail and why some succeed. And what's striking to me about the book is that in fact, large populations do change religions when their societies confront each other. Uh, it's a big deal and it cuts deep into the psyche of the players. So I'm really encouraged by this model of uh, that needs to be taken more seriously 
uh, and the idea that people give up the, uh, their gods and take on other gods under the flow of historical process uh, is just fascinating. And there's so much more. I mean, if you take Israel or Christianity, the number of, of religions that preceded them and affected what came later is huge. I mean, there are, like, there are very few societies that don't have uh, at least five, and in some cases, 10 or 12 previous religions that form the psyche of the people. So I find that just amazing. And, and so is Arnold Toynbee's The Study of History. There's a one volume uh, reduced version on uh, uh, at Amazon that's really very good to read. He's a great writer. Thanks, Doug. Um, anyone else have experience reading Toynbee? I don't. I don't really under know Toynbee's attitude about history or meta history or, or whatever. Um, and I know that locating better descriptions of history has been important in my life. Like, like there were moments when I'm like, oh, okay. So th this is a different way of seeing what I've been told so far, and it, it's informative and useful for me. Um, and I don't know how Toynbee fits in that place. Anybody? I'd like to point out that rather than Toynbee, I read Mumford. And again, you know, the meta narrative is why don't more people read? That's what I'm concerned with. Why, you know, yes, I gosh, I would love to write, read Toynbee. Um, he's on the bucket list. I've got a book that I haven't read of his. But more, how do I spend more time reading? How do I take what Doug Carmichael has got from Toynbee and in the transhumanist narratives or meta narratives of Silicon Valley, you know, they want to basically upload our brains into computers. And so all those files can be transferred instantly. Bullshit. It's the time that it takes an organism to do the work that Doug Carmichael did or I've done with Mumford, and how do we basically, you know, the Internet Archive, what is that motto? Um, universal access to all human knowledge or all knowledge. Well, that's fine as far as that goes. You can bring me to Toynbee, but am I going to basically get the same thing, same insights that Doug has had and how much thermodynamic energy, you know, or, you know, life energy in time, in terms of cost, um, you know, the friends that I'm not hanging out with, drinking whiskey around a campfire, in order to read Toynbee. That stored human knowledge, that's amazing. That's how we are different from um, other social insects and social animals, baboons or wolf packs. We have a symbol, sim, sim, symbol based connectivity, which is amazing. But there's, as Bateson and, and you know, the cybernetics group points out, there's also forbidden knowledge and, and knowledge that, you know, a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. And basically, we can manipulate mass audiences with a little knowledge um that's repeated over and over and over again boy do people know how to do that in media which is our mass connection environment and it's toxic i would love toynbee rather than trump to be in my youtube feed it's not don't know how to make that so do we have him exhumed Shall we have him exhumed? <laughs> well, that's exactly what Doug is doing. Doug is taking the word, Doug Carmichael. <laughs> oh, sorry. I'm uh, too bad Doug Breitbart had to go. But Doug, yeah, is, Doug had to go. Yeah, Doug is, is taking the, you know, words of the dead 
and saying, this is how it affects my present. And that's amazing. And that's what we as humans do. We can take Euclid, we can take Aristotle, we can take, you know, Jesus Christ or, or you know, a, a fictional representation of Aragorn or, or Gandalf and say, aha, this speaks to me in my present. And a wolf pack, you know, has, you know, a, a hierarchy of, of leadership and that doesn't have that same symbolic judgment or insight to say i can be a better leader or a better peer or peer mentor or you know you know my place in the hierarchy of things can be more influential from the influence of somebody who's died 40 50 100 700 years ago how There's a wonderful you... episode Go ahead, with Machiavelli, who was a great reader. And he had a tower where he would go in the evening after a day's work, dressed in the equivalent of a tuxedo, formal business wear. And he said he would sit down and read the ancient books and hold conversations with the mighty dead. Thank you. Um, and I'll just, um, and I think this is a way of getting back to our topic a little bit. When I hear references to Mumford or Toynbee, who are kind of towering intellects in the Western canon, I'm reminded that they're in the Western canon and they're old, dead, white British guys. And I'm really interested in synthesizing and comparing what they came up with and how they influenced Western thinking with everything else we're trying to bring into the conversation here uh, about indigenous ways of knowing. And um, I think some pieces of the puzzle of what happened uh, and at the super scale fountain of events or cascade of events that Pete referred to uh, is buried in some of those comparisons, I think. Well, just to say, to Toynbee is, uh, sees the West as probably a failed society over mechanization and the loss of any spiritual understanding. And it's, it's just so interesting how many different interesting and actually valid causal narratives we could create about how that happened and, and what its effects are. And, the causal narrative that you have in your head greatly influences what you think you should do next. So comparing notes on these narratives, I think is interesting and useful. And then every, every now and then uh, I wind up in conversations that drift too, too far into the abstract. And I start to realize that they're not necessarily like helpful. Um, we're getting near the end of our time. Um, What's the Dr. Hope puppet? Oh, there you go. One indigenous way of doing is putting on a mask and embodying another consciousness in the voodoo dance or the, um, the agora, the play of Orpheus and Uridici, Uridice, where basically you are now inhabiting the god and you're, the god is speaking through you. Now, I wish Doug Breitbart were here because I think that's what he's pointing to is we all have masks. I'm wearing a mask right now. I'm wearing my um, uh, OGM mask. Your I'm a I'm civilized not, human mask. Well, I'm not wearing my Internet Archive mask. I'm not wearing my um, hanging out with uh, a friend mask. I am being a consciousness in the present that is receptive to a screen 
a reality one pixel deep where a representation of Janet and Ken and Carl and Pete and Jerry and Doug are influencing the mask that I am wearing right now. Now, when I channel, you know, the God of destruction. <laughs> what fun. This is not, <laughs> this is, you know, a, a different mask that I'm thinking, you know, as, you know, in my discussions with um, uh, Jack and Stephanie and the other people of AIM, you know, doing universal imagination, um, custodianship of the earth, and mentoring to the underprivileged young, they're wearing masks, but they're changing masks. They're wearing different masks. They're not only wearing one mask as I am wearing one mask right here and right now, which is my OGM mask. And I'm kind of, you know, being challenged by Doug Breitbart's notion, notions that I don't really understand to say, aha, is there something here where there are different tools that we can use to inspire people to have that kind of agoric connection that the city of Athens had in the plays of Euripides or the you know, narratives of Homer where everybody like when I was a kid, you only had ABC, CBS, and NBC, and everybody knew who Walter Cronkite was. And everybody knew when Walter Cronkite changed his mind about the Vietnam War on air. And that was a powerful togetherness that in the 500 million blogs of Spear and, and you know, attention economy, that's all shattered. We don't have that connectivity at scale in the same way that I did when I was seven, seventeen, or or so. I would love to con I would love to compare the reach that Joe Rogan has with the reach that Cronkite had in his day, for example. And I think that some of these modern stars who have audiences much larger than mainstream media, super shockingly large audiences have crazy reach it's just that there are so many more of them and we can everybody has access to the channel because it costs nothing to participate that we are now flooded with people trying to be that become that person but but they but the reach is impressive like modern reach is crazy stuff um I, i'm always disheartened when i watch old jay leno clips of him interviewing people on the street showing them a picture of somebody it's like who is this and it's like a picture of bill gates or the president of the united states and people don't know you know where is bolivia isn't that in africa um we are we are way too ignorant um ken i'm mindful that you usually uh need to bounce at the half and that you often bring us a gift of a poem and i would love to uh, give you the space to do that if you if you have done such a thing again. Thank you. Um, just reflecting on this conversation, we haven't talked a lot about indigenous wisdom. We've talked around it, haven't, we've talked at it, we haven't actually mentioned it very much. I haven't seen too much. And I've been thinking, you know, I have, somebody said a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. I have a thimble full of indigenous knowledge in my life, having been exposed to a few different teachers. And um, one thing I noticed that that is, very challenging to think for people who are western and educated industrial rich and democratic is that there's a tremendous fear of the superstition of indigenous peoples last week on the call um doug was mentioning the the kogi people and you know they, they have these oracles and and these rituals and people are like oh man that's that's you know voodoo stuff it was actually mark saying voodoo that reminded me of this <laughs> I think that freaks people out, like because it's it's putting people directly in touch with a non-rational um, world, which happens to exist just as much as any other world. You know, uh, William James said we're separated by the thinnest of veils from these other worlds, and I don't think modern people, or I should say, contemporary people, because modernity occurred a few centuries ago, I don't think contemporary people are are up 
and ready for that. They don't have a nervous system for it. They don't have the cultural concepts for it. And it freaks them out and they run away. And, and that could be a contributing factor to why we are lacking in indigenous knowledge today among most uh, industrialized people. So with that, I will bring us to the great D.H. Lawrence, Escape. When we get out of the glass bottles of our ego and we escape like squirrels turning in the cages of our personality and get into the forests again, we shall shiver with cold and fright. But things will happen to us so that we don't know ourselves. Cool, unlying life will rush in, and passion will make our bodies taut with power. We shall stamp our feet with our new power, and old things will fall down. We shall laugh, and institutions will curl up like burnt paper. Love that. Have a great Thank week, y'all. Thank you. Thank you. That was a, a nice coda. I don't know where, you know, I just, I have this library of poems on my computer and I, I listen to these calls and I go, oh, and I start looking up, this, this matches, just, it just, it's a magical thing. Poetry is a magical force. So anyway, have it a great is. week, everybody. It is. Thanks, Ken. Bye. I think that's a really lovely note to wrap our call on. So we will see everybody on the inner tubes and next week. Thanks. Thanks for doing that, Pete. I will go uh, read your output. Huh. Very interesting. You know, one of the things I was trying to do is actually um, minimize disrupting um, with my quote. So I was waiting until just after the silence to ah, sorry. post whatever I had in my chat and stuff so um, rather than barraging <laughs> things so um yeah and then that could tie in great with the um well i mean yeah we'll have to figure out how that ties in with um potentially like that silence break too because i it defeats the on one hand it defeats the purpose of silence is to try to get into like meditation state but then on the other hand then people could be reading those posts that everybody made the last time and that might trigger conversation so just exactly an interesting model so. exactly thanks carl okay sometimes we get overloaded or we sort of miss some of the cues but i appreciate that okay thanks gents <laughs>